So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which goes on and on, has caused and continues to cause much suffering, much grief and emotional trauma worldwide. And the unpredictability, uncontrollability and uncertainties about the virus are causing stress for everyone. And this webinar looks at a few insights from theology and psychology to assist us as we face the challenge of the pandemic and its impacts. And it's really my pleasure today to introduce an old friend, Professor Kuravilla George, affectionately known as KG. Uh, KG is originally from Singapore. He completed his medical education in India and his post-graduation as a psychiatrist in the UK. He currently lives in Melbourne, Australia, and recently retired as the Director of Medical Services at Peter James Centre and Juan Turner Health and clinical director of the Aged Persons Mental Health and ECT for Eastern Health as well. KG was also a clinical professor at Deakin University and clinical associate professor at Monash University in Melbourne. He served as the deputy chief psychiatrist for the state of Victoria from 2002 to 2012. He and his family lived in India as missionaries from 1986 to 1995, and after that he was the General Secretary of the EMFI, the Evangelical Medical Fellowship of India, which is ICMDA's, one of, one of ICMDA's two affiliated member bodies there. In that role he travelled widely visiting medical colleges and mission hospitals, ministering to healthcare professionals. His experience includes a period as doctor with OM's first ship, the, the Logos, and he's married to Margaret, who's from the UK, and they have four grown-up children and four grandchildren. So it's my pleasure, KG, to have you on ICMDA webinars, and we look forward to hearing from you about responding to COVID insights from theology and psychology. Thank you. Yeah, greetings, everyone, and thank you, Peter, for your introduction and for inviting me to do this webinar. So responding to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, we have all uh, been experiencing a critical life event, an event which um, uh, is particularly stressful. I don't have to tell you how stressful it is. We've all gone through it. We in Melbourne ha have just come out of our fifth lockdown. And over the past year, we have, have had you know, 180 days under lockdown one of the longest places having lockdown. So we know the stresses of that very well. And I, I think you know, everyone, almost everyone in the world has had uh, the stress. Now, what I'm going to share today with you is will probably be not anything very uh, significant or you know, things that you don't know as professionals, but my sort of uh, passion these days after I retired is to be able to uh, teach Christians and the church about mental illness and how we can help others. So I hope that more than many of these things that you're going to hear today being of help to you, if these could be used to help others, uh, Christians and non-Christians as they go through this period of uh, stress. Now, as Nolan Hokushima say, uh, has stated, Stress refers to experiencing events that are perceived as endangering one's physical or psychological well-being. And the controllability, the unpredictability and duration or chronicity of a situation affects how stressful it is. And we know that with the COVID, all this applies, all these uh, three things that I've mentioned here. Uh, we still do not know, even medical professionals don't know fully about COVID, what's going on, what's the long-term effects, what is you know, the uh, treatment, if any, that's the best, still working on it. Uh, and unpredictable, how long it's going to go on and on and on. Now, Sydney is currently on a severe uh, lockdown that they are having after not doing very badly uh, the past year, but now they have, are having it. And this is the same thing, the unpredictability of it and the duration or chronicity, how long is it going to go on for, who knows? Uh, so this is why it's causing so much of stress to everyone. The second thing that I want to mention is we are all different in the way we deal with stress. No 
two individuals are the same or identical in the way we deal with stress. And Robert Services said, it isn't the mountain ahead that wears you out, it's the grain of sand in your shoe. You know, the chronicity, the going on and on and on with uh, this. So what is happening to us? Uh, and we have all probably have had some of these uh, feelings. Uh, some might have more than one, some might have all of them. Uh, so what are some of these reactions that we have? Feeling stressed or overwhelmed? It's all there, I'm not going to go through it in detail. Anxiety, worry or fear, racing thoughts, sadness, tearfulness, loss of interest in usual enjoyable activities, physical symptoms that people have such as increased heart rate, stomach upset, fatigue or other uncontrollable sensations, frustration, irritability, anger, and even aggression that comes out in some people, restlessness or agitation and feeling helpless, difficulty concentrating or sleeping and trouble relaxing that some have, feeling disconnected from others, apprehension about going to public spaces, increase in obesity, drug, alcohol, and other addictions that happen at this time, increase in family conflicts. There have been lots written about that recently, domestic violence and sexual abuse that's going on during this, uh, this time. Social isolation can have negative impacts on the mental status of elderly. One of the most uh, important factor in depression in the elderly is social isolation. Uh, and that's for very many normal people, these things go on. But what about those who are struggling with their mental health already? What happens to them during this uh, extra stressful period? So stress-related disorders, including generalized anxiety disorder, phobic anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, et cetera, can get worse during these times of stress that's going on and on and on. Depression, those who are going through depression, it can be aggravated, the symptoms of depression. Serious mental disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and dementia can exhibit worsening symptoms. My specialty is uh, old age psychiatry, as you have heard. You know, just think about someone who is going through dementia, who's already confused. At this time, with uh, again, lockdown, not seeing family, not having the stimulus that they used to probably have, they can become more confused and disorientated. Physical illnesses, which have a relationship to stress, like hypertension, diabetes, asthma, hyperacidity, autoimmune disorders can be aggravated. Behavioral disorders in children can show exaggeration. Example, ADHD, because many of them are not going to go to school, not having the outlets that they uh, have normally, the disorders can be exaggerated. Uh, it is interesting that the last month's British Journal of Psychiatry that came to me uh, recently, there were three articles. And, and interestingly, what I read is that in the first year, I don't know how many of you know this, in the first year of the COVID, in, by the end of the first year, in December 2020, there were 200,000 articles or publications about COVID. 200,000 articles, people writing on different aspects of COVID. Uh, and I don't know what's happened over these past six months, and so it must, might have even doubled the number of articles about uh, COVID. Now, but this last month, there were three main articles in the British Journal of Psychiatry about the impacts of COVID. And interestingly, what they mentioned was that uh, uh, the COVID, uh, what has happened is anxiety states have increased, people with suicidal thoughts have increased, depression, interestingly, has not shown much worsening overall when we're talking about epidemiologically. Uh, uh, that, that it hasn't impacted that, that much. But the, many of these symptoms that have been seen have been worse in females, young people between the ages of 19, uh, 18 to 29, the uh, socially deprived 
individuals and those who suffer from chronic mental disorders. Those are the four categories of people who have shown much worse symptoms of stress and worsening of many of their conditions like anxiety. So what can we do? So we're going to look more at what we can do than what, what's happening. We, as I said, many of us know what's going on. Now, when we're talking about what we can do, there are three main things here, and I'm not going to spend much time on, because we don't have the time. Uh, on the first two, I'm just going to mention it in passing, but go through number three a bit more in detail, the coping strategies. So when we're talking about what we can do or what can we do, first of all, it's the coping styles. And behavioral scientists say that most of us fall into three kinds or uh, three categories uh, we have the three kinds of coping styles that most of us fall into. The first style is what's called self-directing. And people who have this style of coping, they take complete responsibility for everything that happens in life. They say, I, you know, I, my problems are unique and does not wait for supernatural intervention or help from others. Um, the, that's the self-directing. Then there is a collaborating style. And these people, they, I need help and I will seek it. Seeking help is not a sign of weakness. Others can learn from my experience. And then there's what's called the deferring style. And people who have the deferring style, they're passive submission, not doing anything or leaving everything to someone else to sort out. It is somewhat different from feeling helpless, which most people feel sometime or other in their lives. This is actively choosing to be helpless without making any effort to even seek help. And what has been found is people with the self-directing style are less prone to probably to anxiety at, uh, during times of stress and anxiety disorders uh, because they can cope on their own. They are sort of self, uh, uh, they, they uh, look on themselves to cope with that, that what's happening. But when they do have something severe happening, they can have a breakdown. The best style is the collaborating style. I need help, I will seek it. It's not a sign of weakness and being able to share and learn from others and share what's going on with them, which might be of help to others. The differing ones are the people who, uh, who become much more anxious and have all kinds of problems like anxiety and depression. Now, what is resilience? Now, resilience is, is not avoiding difficulties, but facing difficulties and going through problems in life, coming out of them, not unchanged or unaffected, but strengthened and empathetic. So thirdly, when we look at stress, we look at the coping strategies. Now, that's what we're going to spend a bit more time today when we talk about cope, uh, COVID especially. What can we do? First of all, we can protect ourselves. And I'm not going to go into detail. We, we have heard this time and again from the media, from our politicians. We can all learn to protect ourselves and others from COVID-19. Good hygiene, self-isolation, social distancing, wearing of masks in public places, getting tested for COVID, immunization. I put a question mark because there is still a lot of questions about immunization, how effective, or, you know, what's the best to, way, etc. and how, etc. that's still, there are questions about that. Secondly, acknowledge. Now, this is an important area. Acknowledging whatever we are feeling. All of us have got different feelings that is going through us. We can, many of us just suppress our feelings, but if we want to take care of our feelings so that it doesn't become destructive to us, that it doesn't become an illness, it doesn't cause problems, the first thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge what's going on in us. Many of us don't do that. It, uh, and many of us I've heard it because we feel that we are Christians, we should be strong, we should not exp uh, feel the way that we are feeling. I've, I'm sure you've come across Christians who when they're feeling angry, they say, I'm not angry, I'm a Christian. But anger is real. Bible does not say, do not be angry. It says, be angry, but sin not. Take care of your anger. We are all human beings. That means we are emotional beings. We've been made with emotions. Have you seen, heard of Christians who say, when they have lost someone, they're, uh, 
they're saying, well, I do not feel grief. I rejoice because my loved, uh, uh, you know, loved person that I've loved is now in heaven. But do we not grieve somebody who has been, we have been really, uh, you know, in relationship with for years and now going, we have to go accept the feeling that we are going through grief and that we are going through difficulties. It's okay to feel that way. We are emotional beings. So we should allow time to notice and express what we are feeling rather than suppressing it. It's when we suppress it, it comes out in different other forms because emotion is an energy. We cannot keep it contained. It will come out in different ways, either in physical symptoms or signs or other emotional problems. So once we begin to notice it, what can we do with that? We can journal. That's something that we can do. Journal, uh, write down what we are going through, our feelings. We can talk to others. Maybe some of us are better at doing that than others, but all of us can still write down what we are feeling and learn to acknowledge and write it down. And then some of us might be good at channeling our emotions into something creative. It could be drawing, painting, music, writing, gardening, do, your, you know, do it yourself, things that we do in the house. During the... Uh, uh, COVID time that we were the lockdown, I created a little uh, a little uh, pool a garden uh, as my project to channel some of my uh, you know uh, uh, emotions. So conscious effort to concentrate on what we can still do. There are many things we can't do because of the lockdown, because of the COVID, but there are many things that we can do. So consciously try and concentrate and do what we can do. Thirdly, remind. We should remind on a daily basis who we are in Christ. Christ lives in us and we are in Christ. There is no safer place than that. You know, uh, just before the COVID hit, as here in Melbourne, a good friend of mine, very good friend of mine and colleague from work who had retired just before I did, was diagnosed with leukemia, acute leukemia. He has been a great uh, testimony to me. He's been a, a great encouragement to see the way that he has coped with this illness. He has gone through all kinds of things, even the COVID. He suffered from COVID-19 and his ups and downs that he's been going through physically. But the, 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 the witness he has been showing to everyone that comes his way, even when he was in the hospital, uh, the, the, the way that he has shown that there's no safer place. He says, I don't care what happens to me because I know that I am in Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we, are, if we have Christ, no matter what comes, we are safe. And Psalms 73, 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Fourthly, we can give thanks. Give thanks to God every day. Find things daily that we can thank God for. You know, every morning when I get up, I lie in bed and I think, thank God I'm still alive. Thank God that I have a house in this, in this winter here, that my house is warm. Thank God I have food to eat. Thank God I have a family. I have a children and grandchildren and a wife. You know, there's so many things that we can thank God for rather than thinking of the things that we don't have. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And as psychologists say, think of three things that we can thank God for, three things. Write a gratitude letter saying it's very good if we can do that. Who do we address it to? We can address it to God. We can address it to a, a, our husband, our wife, our partner, our friend. Write a gratitude letter. Read Psalm 46 and reflect on the times when God has been a fortress in our life. Relate. God has made us relational human beings. And we know in the Genesis story, God created the heavens and the earth. He looked at everything that he had created and said, it is good. The only time when he said, this is not good, was after creating man. And so that Adam was on his own. 
And he said, this is not good for Adam to be on his own. I need to create a partner for him. So Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be alone. Martin Seligman, who is a famous psychologist, has written, other people are the best antidote to the downs of life and the single most reliable up. Other people are the best antidote to the downs of life and the single most reliable up. We need to protect ourselves from being self-focused and self-preserving. Research shows that we experience more happiness from giving than receiving. To give is happier than to receive. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Let's encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Sixthly, contemplate and modify habits if necessary. Our hearts and minds are shaped by the information we hear and see around us. And this is, forms a lens through which we see the world. We all have a different worldview. Even as Christians, we might have an overall Christian worldview, but within that, we still have all kinds of worldviews. And it is shaped by all the things that we hear and see. The media has a bias, as we all know, to reporting negative experiences and worst case scenarios. In the beginning, when the COVID struck last year, all the, every morning I used to listen what was happening because the politicians were telling you what's happening. Now I can't, I won't even bother to do that. You know, because what's the, what's the point? You know, uh, what's the point? Uh, so uh, beginning to limit the amount of media and whatever we read, let's read reliable sources. The season is an ideal opportunity to be quiet and to read and reflect on God's word and good books. Our world has become less hectic and noisy, so let's use it uh, to, to, to you know, be able to reflect and read and be doing much more reflective times that we can have, which would be good for our soul. Look out for what God is teaching you and how he's maturing you through this time. As, as Psalm says, we read, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Seventhly, perspective. Keep things in perspective. In uncertain situations, it's natural to think of the worst case scenarios and leaves us feeling overwhelmed, helpless, vulnerable. So let's keep our uh, uh, things in perspective here. Some questions to help our thinking. What are the things within my control? There are things that are without, uh, we can't control. The COVID that's going on, we can't control it. The political decisions made by the politicians about lockdown, about various things, we have no control over it. What, what do I have control over? I have control over you know, when I can go out, what I can do, what I can read, what I can think, what I can do uh, uh, with my life. There's so many things that we can. Let's do, uh, concentrate on that rather than what we don't have control. Am I, am I overestimating the likelihood of the worst case scenario? That often happens to us. As human beings, something happens, we think about the worst case scenario. What strategies have helped me cope with challenging situations in the past? And this is where we can learn from what has happened in the past that will serve me well during this time. If we, what we have learned when we have had disasters, when we have had difficult situations, all of us have had that in our life. What have we learned from that that we can use now? What is a small, helpful, or positive action I can take now? What can I do positively? Maybe for my family, for my neighbors. What is it that I can do? Do not be anxious about everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Pray. Eighthly, write down your worries as they come up in the day, and then set aside 10 minutes in the evening to pray about them. Give them over to God. If you cannot change your situation, try to change your attitude. Let's try and change our attitude instead. While you practice social distancing, also practice cognitive distancing. We'll come to that later. What I mean by cognitive distancing. We all know what social distancing is. It's become a, you know, a, a word that everyone now uh, in the vocabulary, social distancing. Pray through a psalm that you find helpful. Many people are praying Psalm 46 or 91. Pray for your friends family members, for the government, and for those working in the healthcare professions. Rhythm. Ninthly, now that for some of us the daily routine is in disarray, it's important to implement structure, rhythm, and discipline. You know, I 
fortunately or unfortunately retired just before uh, the uh, COVID hit uh, Australia. I, re I retired just before that. Now, uh, in, uh, and in retirement, I can be spending time in bed much later, uh, don't get up and get dressed with my night clothes. But I've made it a point to get up, get changed, get onto my desk, do some work, to get into a, dis a routine uh, that is important for our sanity and for our discipline, to have that rhythm and discipline. How so? Create a daily routine. Enforce boundaries with colleagues or with in your home, even your home environment, uh, with with your uh, others' boundaries and respect others' boundaries and create boundaries so that it is easier now that you are at home twenty four hours to be in each other's, uh, you know, uh, uh, encroaching the boundaries and causing problems and conflicts. Make time for pleasurable activities and hobbies. Make time to rest. Be mindful of the amount of screen time. It's easy to sit in front of the television or the computer for hours and hours. Uh, uh, you're try having and try to do activities that do not involve looking at a device. Try to get sufficient sleep, not staying up or sleeping in too late. Tenthly, active. Be active, stay active. As we all know, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So let's take care of it. Exercise and stretch regularly as you may be more sedentary or holding more stress and tension. And we know that research, we more and more people talk about exercise and lifestyle factors, whatever we talk about, whether it's mental health or physical health, we know it reduces stress and restores the body. Feed ourselves on nutritious food, refraining from emotional or mindless eating. Exercise and good nutrition boosts immunity and keep us physically and mentally strong. Get help. Continue taking your regular medications. These are things that we have to you know, advise our patients, our colleagues, our friends in the church. Continue seeing your doctor or health professional as required and if necessary by telehealth. Discuss and seek help of family and friends. If our worries, anxieties and fears are getting or impacting our life, Seek help of pastors, church leaders, counselors, and other health professionals. Read and study from reliable sources. Then what can we do? Give help. Not only should we get our help, we give help. In times of hardship, most people are resilient and can draw and build on natural coping strategies. However, some people, however, may not have the coping skills. So us, yourself, I have to ask myself, which neighbor or friend needs our help right now? With whom could you or me share our resources? Philippians 2, 4 says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. So who are some of these at-risk individuals? They were struggling with mental health before the pandemic, so now it has become worse. They are elderly, have limited social contacts, and or live alone, are without or have limited access to internet are living with household discord or domestic violence, have lost employment and or are in financial difficulty, have a physical illness or disability or have loved ones who are sick and are unable to visit them, have loved ones who have passed away and may be unable to attend the funeral, are self-isolating due to suspected or confirmed COVID-19. These are some of the people who are, who are at risk. How can we help them? Check in regularly with people who are at risk of poor mental health and see how they are going. Drop a flyer in letter boxes around your neighborhood with your name and contact number. Establish a fund to support people around you who have lost their jobs or who are struggling financially. When the COVID it hit India and we heard of all the mission hospitals that were struggling, I sort of spearheaded a, a appeal for a couple of missions. We can't help all the mission hospitals. Uh, mission hospitals in India. And it was tremendous to see the, the support that we got. Our, uh, the aim that uh, the, was through one of the organizations that I'm, I'm involved with, our aim was to try and raise uh, $100,000 and we raised it, amazingly. Some people said, oh, you're being too optimistic to try and get that. So start a fund to support people around you who have lost their jobs or are struggling financially. 
start up a prayer chain with your local community. Donate to your local or global charity who are supporting the poor, homeless, and vulnerable at this time. Strengthen bonds with people in your home and neighborhood and learn new things about them. During times of uncertainty, people are more willing to hear the, and receive the gospel. So share with people how your faith is helping you cope. As I said, my friend who is going through leukemia at the same time as the COVID, how he has, it's been a, a tremendous encouragement to me, how he has been witnessing, even when he's been physically so low, what he, what he has, uh, how he has shown through, uh, the light he has shown to so many people. When out of your home, smile and say hello to people. You may be the only person with whom they connect that day or even longer. Do not be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Confess your worries to others and to God and be open to carrying each other's burdens. Finally, don't lose hope. Put your trust in God. And as Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Now, in closing, I just want to say, uh, uh, in the next few minutes, I just want to talk about two things. One is anticipatory stress. Now, we're talking about stress here, and we all go through periods of stress. That is normal. Uh, we have all been created, whether we are human beings or animals, with the fight or flight response. You're all medical professionals. I don't have to tell you the physiology of this. So we have been created so that when we, uh, we, when we come to a challenge, we either fight or flee. What happens to our, in our body? We begin to, a, a challenge that we face, a crisis that we face, uh, the blood flow to our brain increases, the blood flow to our muscles increase so that we can either fight or flee. Uh, the, uh, uh, the sugars and uh, the, uh, are released into our body that's been stored so that we have more energy. The gastrointestinal system has less blood flow, it's not important at that time. The reproductive system is not important at that time. The blood vessels dilate so that more blood goes to the brain, but in some others it might be constricted. So these are all physiological changes in our body. Uh, but the problem is, I mean, the best example is if you look at a cat and a dog, what happens to the cat when it faces a dog? The pupils dilate, the hair stand on end, the paws, protrude, the back is arched because a cat is either going to fight the dog or flee. That is normal. And it happens to us as well. But the difference is the cat, when it's not facing the dog, is not lying on your couch or a couch and thinking all the time, what am I going to do when the cat, a dog comes and continuously, continuously secreting adrenaline and corticosteroids into into the cat's system. Human beings are the only beings that you are constantly throwing adrenaline and corticosteroids into our system because we are worrying about the climate change. We are worrying about the possibility of nuclear war. We are worrying about the consequences of COVID. We are worrying about our children's education. We are worrying about our children's uh, marriage. We are worrying about our future as we grow older. Constantly, what are we doing? We are causing damage to our bodies right from the head to the toe. Our body is being damaged because of this flow of adrenaline and corticosteroids. And modern research, it was only last month I heard that even dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, we still do not know the exact cause. Some folks are now thinking whether this is this constant chronic stress that could be one of the factors for dementia. The consequences of sustained fight or flight, more diabetes, more hypertension, more everything, from, as I said, from head to toe. You know, the most often stated commandment in the Bible is fear not or do not be afraid. I've read somewhere that's been mentioned 365 times, one for every day of the year. Do not be afraid or fear not. Do not fear for I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Charles Spurgeon has said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. And finally, 
cognitive distancing I mentioned, we all know about social distancing. What is cognitive distancing? Many of us have been in situations where our emotions prevent us from seeing the big picture and responding appropriately. Just think about when somebody uh, 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 makes you angry, whether it be your husband or your wife or your children, immediately we begin to react and we say things and do things that we regret for later on. Cognitive distancing or psychological distancing is our ability to try and step back at that time without an immediate response, survey the environment and reflect on the course of action instead of being dominated by immediate stimulation and acting so that we can think, reflect, and then act, which might be much, much better for us, for the other person, for everyone else. That is cognitive distancing. It's also the temporal distancing of events. So rather than immediately reacting what is happening then, for example, events in the distant future are treated differently to events in the near future, learning from what has happened in the past and being able to behave in a more uh, better manner that's going to be constructive for everyone concerned. That is cognitive distancing. So, John, in John, we read, peace I live with you, Jesus says. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Isn't it amazing that in the Bible, we, uh, we major on things like uh, the commandments which says do not kill, do not commit adultery, whatever. But the most often stated commandment in the Bible is do not fear, do not be anxious. Be anxious for do not be anxious for, for anything. I'll end there for now. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, KG. Uh, wow, what, a, what an amazing masterly blend of the experience of a psychiatrist, the, the knowledge of a biblical scholar, and, and the wisdom too that, that comes with it. So we've got the questions starting to come in now, KG, and the first one is from uh, Claudia Stein. A lot of psychiatrists aren't asking questions today. Right. How can you keep someone who is deeply depressed, expressing a lot of anger and who refuses to seek help, refusing the collaborative strategy that you've talked about, other than pray, of course, how can you support someone like this and help them to, to get help? Well, if, if it's a psychiatrist that's uh, asking that question, <laughs> I'm sure you will know that that is one of the great challenges that we, we have as psychiatrists, that we, we can't force anyone to get that help. We can only encourage. And uh, the, how can we encourage you? It's a you know, Christian a brother or sister is to be alongside them, show through our love and empathy that we are concerned with about them and hopefully because of the relationship that we have built uh, that they would be probably more willing to listen to us uh, I, I mean in, in places like India in some ways it might be a bit easier but the Asian culture where very often uh, even though the person might not be willing because of the pressure that families because of the the family structure and the extended family and the influence of the family they might be a, a bit more willing to listen to those in the family. Otherwise, it certainly is a challenge, especially those who are seriously unwell, those who are suffering from serious mental illness, that's often a big challenge. And that's why we often then have to use, if there is, uh, that uh, they've come to the point where their life or the life of others are at risk uh, because they're not having the treatment that they need, then we have to use the Mental Health Act. But hopefully that's, you know, uh, that's uh, something that we use as a last resort. Thank you. And my apologies too, for if I gave the impression that Claudia Stein was a psychiatrist, she's just reminded us she's a public health physician and epidemiologist, which, which I knew. So that's why she was asking the question. But I, I've noticed that we have quite a few psychiatrist names have turned up on, on the call today, many of whom you know, Gagey. The next question is from Paul Hudson who says, uh, R.C. Sproul said that suffering is one thing, but suffering without meaning is particularly toxic and not God's purpose. 
how can we address meaning as Christian health professionals in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, I, as Christians, everything that happens to us, I believe there is a meaning. I mean, this this is a, a, a one thing again, you know, that I've been reflecting. I mean, during this time of reflection that I have more time now in reflecting that uh, everything that happens to us, I can probably find that God is trying to teach me something, even though I sometimes I've been big headed and want to you know do my own thing but when we have that time probably uh, we can see that god has something that we want to teach us and you know when we uh, even when we read uh things like what happens to, i've just read job again uh, just finished today uh what happened in his life so we can see that it's hopeless situation but how god comes through and speaks to him so how do we if we if we are able to find that ourselves i think um we will be able to then probably show it to others through our own life you know i mean it's interesting isn't it that we know that there are so many different forms of psychological therapies in the world today many many different schools and everyone brings about a new kind of psychotherapy or psychological therapy but when studies have been done, they have shown that there's no one of the therapies not superior to another. Usually the key is the therapist, not the therapy. It's the therapist that makes the difference. The, uh, the person's relationship with the, with the patient or the patient's, uh, person's relationship with the person that you're trying to help. So this is why I'm saying the key at the end of the day is our the, the relationship, and if we believe as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit in dwelling in us, in every interaction that we have with the human being, the Holy Spirit is working, whether we realize it or not. And even when we want to try and, you know, uh, create some understanding in the other person, there's a lot of block. We just have to sometimes leave it and say, yep, God, you can do this impossible. It seems to be very difficult here. Holy Spirit, you're working. And let's, we'll have to leave that sometimes in his hands. Nothing can separate us from the love of God and uh, he will never leave us nor forsake us and is with us always. Uh, PV Cherry, and I'm sure you know KG, uh, yep. he's asking some, some good Christian believers in our Chennai Assembly of God Church feel that the government must not force citizens to take COVID vaccination. Isn't it better to trust Jesus to protect from COVID instead of taking vaccination? It's difficult to talk with such Christians, even as our church pastor is exhorting all members to cooperate with the, the government. This, this is a little bit off track for your topic today, but uh, would you like to make any comment on, on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, everyone should have the freedom to, uh, nobody should be coerced, I believe, to take any treatment for that matter. Uh, that's the free will of a choice that we have. Uh, but at the same time, as Christians, we don't only think about ourselves. We have to think about our families. We have to think about our community. So, you know, God has said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And sometimes we might have to have to do things, uh, not just for our sake, but also for thinking about the sake of the community that we are living in as a Christian. Thank you. Um, Paul, this is an anonymous uh, attendee, but Paul speaks a lot, uh, he or she says, in 2 Corinthians, of course, that book where Paul really wears his heart on his sleeve and perhaps like perhaps no other, talks in 2 Corinthians about the stresses that he and other Christians face. For example, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, and other challenges he faced, uh, whole catalogues of them, of course. Do you think that uh, Christians in the West, uh, and you're a man who's lived both in, in the global South and in the West now, do you think Christians in the West are less willing to handle stress today than perhaps we were in previous generations, that we think it's something abnormal rather than just part of life? I'm not sure about that. I mean, you, uh, yeah, you, you often hear that happening, that the younger generation are less resilient 
than the older generation that went through the war days and they were much more resilient. There might be a point to that, but I think we need to also accept the fact that probably uh, when I look, for example, at the Indian uh, culture and background and the Western, uh, in India, we, we are not willing to express our emotions or show our emotions or even, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge the way that we are feeling. As I was telling, in the, uh, one of the first things to do is acknowledge what we are feeling. Probably one of the differences is that in the current, uh, well, in the Western world, and probably among the younger generation, people are more willing to acknowledge what's going on in them and to be seeking help for that. You know, for example, uh, uh, in India, even now I know if you go to many of the villages, you'll probably find many, many um, uh, who have symptoms of what we used to call hysteria. Now we call it, you know, somatoform disorders, which we'll never probably find that these days very much in the West, you know, people becoming uh, uh, blind or uh, unable to hear because of the stress that they are going through, because they are unable to express it, it then comes out in all forms of physical symptoms and signs. You find less here in the West, you know, because people probably are much more willing to express it uh, and to share the way that they are feeling. But so I, I do not know at the end of the day whether we can say that the Western world or the younger generation is res resilient, but it might be that, uh, that we, we are a bit better now of recognizing what we, going, we are going through and accepting help and seeking help. Thank you, and uh, thanks for pointing out too that there are strengths and weaknesses in all cultures and the way that we respond to, to these things. And you talked too about the personality differences, the, the three types of people, the deferrers, the collaborators, and the self-directors. And you said that often self-directors start off much better, but they can suddenly collapse with overwhelming stress, and it's best to be a collaborator. Uh, it said that we can't change our personality, but can we change our coping style? So if you're a deferrer, can you become a collaborator or a self-director? And if so, how do you go about doing it? Well, uh, well uh, certainly personalities are difficult to change, um, but it, again, it's not impossible to change our personalities. It is, again, acknowledging what we are. So, but certainly coping styles we can, we, we are all different. I am, if I look at that, I'm very much a self-directing kind of a person. Uh, and I often say I can, you know, I can live on a, uh, on a, uh, uh, on a isolated island on my own. I can do that, but, uh, but that's my personality. But I've learned over the years that family is important. Friends are important. So it might not come to me naturally, but we can, we can make, uh, so uh, self, uh, people who have got the st self-directing styles, yes, there are strengths of the self-directing styles, but certainly collaborators are, collaborative style is much better and learning to do that is something that we can learn to do. I mean, probably easier than probably changing our personalities. Once we realize what kind of a style we are or what kind of a style we function as, we can probably change or make some difference. We may not completely change uh, the kind of person we are, but our styles of functioning can be probably uh, changed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we talked a bit about the direct pressures of COVID on uh, each other, but it's often seeing what other people are going under that or uh, are suffering that can cause suffering in it itself. So Jenny Swankot's asking, how can we manage the vicarious trauma that some of us are experiencing every time we hear and see about the dreadful impact of COVID in other countries uh, where there might be much more hardship than, than we have or, or much fewer resources? Uh, and, and I guess, uh, as she points out, we could just become indifferent to others suffering or we could get overly involved in it and not and not be helpful. 
how do we steer a course between indifference and vicarious trauma, if you like? Hmm. Um, can I, uh, at, at this point, give a plug to one of the, uh, in a post-retirement, I'm involved with a couple, of, a few uh, sort of Christian organizations, and I think uh, it was up on the slide. One is a center for theology and psychology, and the other, which is part of the Melbourne School of Theology, which is uh, a new initiative, which is growing fairly rapidly. The other one is what's called an organization called Transform for Life. And that is very much a trauma uh, informed kind of a, a trying to help uh, not professionals, but lay people, how to help others who are going through trauma. Because every one of us, the, it comes from the premise that all of us have some trauma or other. So being able to recognize that in ourselves and then to help others. And so there's a, a course that is has been developed over this past year, specific for, for the COVID, and it's called agent, being an agent of healing at a time of crisis. And in, in that course, I mean, if you are interested, if, you, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you know, we are happy to sort of provide that course. And in that, you know, the, there are four modules. One is uh, understanding crisis and trauma. Secondly, is caring for those suffering from uh, crisis induced trauma, then coping styles and resilience and compassion fatigue and caring for the caregiver. I think what you're asking now is you know, about that, Co compassion fatigue. How do we prevent ourselves from having compassion fatigue and to also care for those who are caregiving so that we don't come to that point. So th this uh, is a good course, even though I was, I'm a psychiatrist, I found it going through that course quite helpful to me. And if anybody's interested, let me know and uh, we'll see what we can do to help you. Thank you very much. And sadly, we're just about run out of time now for uh, any more questions. So, well, I, I just want to thank you again, KG, for a, a masterful talk, uh, so practical, uh, so uh, easy to, to apply. I think it's perhaps easy to be overwhelmed by all the great advice information that we got today, but just to challenge perhaps to think of one or two things that we can put into practice as a result of this and to and to think uh, through the points that were made uh, again. And I think uh, one of the things that really struck me, uh, KG, was your wonderful Christian biblical CBT, if you like, uh, helping us to think the right way, the sound bites. Uh, don't uh, do what you can do. Don't worry about what you can't do. Give thanks for what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have. Change what's in your control. Don't worry about what's out of your control. But change uh, your attitude, even though you can't change your situation. And the way we think along these biblical lines uh, can do so much in terms of preserving our own uh, mental health through the situation so that uh, we can then be in a much better position to be outward directed and to help others and uh, to, to, to give to others in whatever way it is of our time or our money uh, or our skills. So it just uh, remains to me again to say uh, thank you to everyone, to KG and to everyone who's assisted today and to all of you. May God bless you and keep you and uh, keep holding it all together during the challenges that this, this uh, COVID, which is completely under God's control, has uh, thrown to us. God bless you. Thank you.